Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the second Moon Lecture of the 2019 series here at St. Mark's. My name is Alan Jones. I'm the lead pastor here in the congregation. Great that you're all here this evening. Uh, I believe we're in for a treat as we hear Dr. Julianne Malveau. Uh, this series has been going for quite a number of years in the life of this congregation, and uh, our goal is always to bring exciting, cutting-edge speakers who can challenge us and engage us in the issues of the day. Uh, and I know we're not going to be uh, disappointed this evening. Uh, I've been asked to mention that uh, tickets are still available for the Yamishal Sinda lecture, which is the next one in November, but there are only a few tickets left. So if you're interested in coming to that lecture, do please uh, get them tonight or as soon as you can. Um, at the end of the lecture, I'm going to ask that you stay seated until we leave, uh, and then Dr. Malvo and I will be across in the, um, the hall across the courtyard there, and there will be all sorts of goodies to eat and drink, so do please come over there. And you'll see from the green things hanging from the roof that we're in a series of sermons on the Sermon on the Mount at the moment here at St. Mark's. Um, I'm finding it very interesting and challenging. So we do have other gatherings in this room at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning. <laughs> I'm a preacher, I have to mention that. Hey, I'm really excited to uh, call forward Miss Betty Hill, who's coming on behalf of the Delta Sigma Theta sorority to present some flowers to our speaker this evening. Another Kodak moment. I guess they're not Kodak moments anymore, are they? Uh, another iPhone moment. <laughs> well, Dr. Julianne Malvo, as they say, needs no introduction, and you've seen a lot of the printed material. Uh, she has extraordinary qualifications, an extraordinary background. Uh, she's a native Californian, by the way, from San Francisco, and uh, it, it was fun talking with her over dinner about her religious experience in her life because she was raised as a good Catholic, and she has strayed away and strayed to all sorts of other places, and the straying is continuing. Is that right? Is that, would that be appropriate to say that? Yeah, that's about right. Uh, at the moment, uh, coming into land at the AME Church, um, in, in Washington, D.C., where she's based. Um, uh, she's extraordinary. I, I think what makes her so extraordinary is that she has skills in a number of different areas. And what she's able to do is to weave things together in a way that few people can. Uh, she's obviously a highly trained and skilled economist, especially in the area of labor economics. She's an author, she's a social commentator, she's a political commentator, she talks about women's issues, she talks about uh, community issues, African-American issues. Uh, she was president of Bennett College. Uh, she's had all sorts of wide-ranging experiences and she brings them together and currently does a number of things. Has a radio show, a TV show, writes and us speaking like this and, and is available for commentary in lots of different situations. So uh, she's a highly respected voice and so we're very honored and privileged tonight to welcome Dr. Julianne Malvo to be our Moon Lecturer. Well, Pastor Jones, thank you so much for the invitation and also for that warm uh, introduction. I also want to thank the ladies of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated for the beautiful flowers. Those of y'all who don't know, we are the biggest and the baddest black women's sorority. In the <laughs> there are others, but we're the biggest and the baddest. <laughs> and uh, founded in 1913, uh, we are the women who refuse to be turned away from the suffrage march. Um, they said we were not supposed to march. 
but we did it anyway because we were not studying those people. And um, so I am delighted to be a member of the sorority since I pledged in 1973. Don't do the math. Uh, <laughs> but I'm not ashamed. I have started so much stuff and kept up so much stuff that on my last birthday I said, it's a wonder I'm still alive. <laughs> just because, you know. Uh, but in any case, it's, ju I, it's just really a joy and a privilege to be here uh, to give this moon lecture and to talk about some of the things that are near and dear to my heart. Uh, really, I want to talk about race, but not just about race, but about where we're going with it. But we have to start, if we talk about race, we got to go back and start at the beginning. And this is a picture of the Sankofa bird. And the Sankofa bird, uh, Sankofa is a word in the Twi language of Ghana that translates to go back and get it. It means go back to get your history, go back and deal with it. And that's what we have to do in this country. One of the challenges we have is that we really don't know American history. And it's frightening how little we know. I find that when I'm doing certain work, people will look at me with a blank look on their face or they'll tell me this really didn't happen. I happen to be on the National African American Reparations Commission. Um, and we have a partnership with the ACLU, which was really quite wonderful that the ACLU was willing to partner with us uh, because we think that more white people need to know more about reparations and what the rationale for it is. But I did the first piece, we had a, had a blog and I did a piece on the blog and the young man who was editing me said, are you sure this happened? I'm like, dude, I wrote it down, didn't I? I, I gave him links, I've, you know, editors sometimes are the most lovely people in the world and sometimes they're the wretched of the earth. Uh, <laughs> like there are some editors who truly believe that, they, that you can't write perfectly, so they must improve whatever you've written. And even if, um, they just have to improve it. Sometimes a good editor is like, you know, sort of a skilled dives person. They go in and they just tweak. You know, may take a comma out, but some editors are like, hmm. So I knew this young man was gonna have problems, so I gave him all the links and everything he needed, and he says, are you sure? Yeah, I'm sure. Unfortunately, I'm sure. Lots of people this year are celebrating, or not celebrating, really commemorating the fact that black, that America's almost original sin, and I say almost original sin because the original sin was the uh, evisceration of Native American people, and we have to always talk about that, which we don't talk about enough. Uh, on Monday, we will, in Washington, D.C., celebrate Indigenous Peoples Day. We don't do uh, Columbus Day. I used to tell folks Columbus was like this drunk guy who um, got lost. And he ended up, you know, hey, he was trying to go to China. And he ended up here. But in any case, but we'll be celebrating Indigenous Peoples Day and we shouldn't ever forget the contribution that Indigenous people have made. And the fact that, you know, our evil, our country's basic evil, wipes so many of them out. But the other original sin, of course, is enslavement. And all of the things that went with enslavement. And this is something that folks don't want to talk about. But the challenge in not talking about it is that then you, you normalize inequality. So as an example, on the first Friday of every month, you hear about the unemployment rate. The unemployment rate, if you believe the person who lives in the house that enslaved people built, I, pastor, I try not to curse in church, so I won't mention the name of the president, whatever he is. Uh, the, yeah, I call him 45. Sometimes Reverend William Barber, who's a dear friend, calls him nine because he says he's not going to waste two syllables. Just <laughs> so, <laughs> but in any case, every first Friday, you will hear the unemployment numbers. Very rarely will you hear the black unemployment numbers. You'll hear the overall number. And that, in some way, is normalizing, basically, inequality. Not talking about what the differences are. When we saw income numbers change, we just got the income latest income data uh, in the second week of, Fe of September, rather, um, and average income for white folks is about 60 and change, for blacks just 40, two-thirds, and this has been a ratio that we've seen all the time. But you didn't hear, the headlines didn't say that. The headlines said incomes went up. So you're normalizing the fact that you think that black folks should have less and should be less. And Dr. King, even in his letter to, from the Birmingham jail said, when you are forever fighting a feeling of nobodiness, then you understand why we find it difficult to wait. The letter to the Birmingham jail became the foundation for his book, Why We Can't Wait. But that was the first crack at it in which he chided clergy 
to do the right thing and ask them, why do you want us to keep waiting? And I think we're in a similar situation now where people want to know why black folks are not satisfied. And the answer lies in the data. Why would we be satisfied if the unemployment rate were 3.5%, but it's 5.5% for us? What's satisfactory about that? There's nothing, when you're looking at income data, what's satisfactory about that? The fact is that there's nothing satisfactory about the way race relations work in this country, and there's nothing satisfactory about the number of folks who essentially accept it. No, it's not my problem. I, I can't tell you how many times I have conversations with the mel what I call the melanin deficient, also known as white folks, um, <laughs> who will say something to me like, well, I never had any slaves. Yes, but you live in a country where the economic system was based on enslavement, and even now you benefit from it. So don't tell me that you didn't. I don't want to hear it. I simply don't want to hear it. But if it's 400 years since the first enslaved people were here, and that's not necessarily clear, there are a lot of scholars who are talking about whether that's accurate or not, but if it's 400 years, more significantly is that it's 100 years since the red summer of 1919. And the red summer of 1919 was a period where there were almost 30 racial actions around the country. In Chicago, um, now Chicago fought back. So you had, um, the number of white deaths almost approximated the number of black deaths. But all around the country, you had basically people fighting. Why were they fighting? Because black men were coming back from World War I, and they weren't taking any mess. They simply weren't taking any mess. But the other reason you had the fighting was because of economic envy. And this is something that we have to deal with. When African American people do succeed, there's enormous resistance on the part of the overall society. Let me. Uh, I have some numbers in here that are really interesting. Of course, I think the numbers are interesting. Y'all might not, but I'm sharing with you anyway. Uh, where's my numbers? Okay, they're not in here. They're in here. I can make. I, I can tell you the numbers anyway. At the end of enslavement, here it is: the ratio of black wealth to white wealth. At the end of enslavement, by 1880, African American people had one dollar for every thirty-six dollars that whites had. By 1890, it decreased. One dollar for every $26 white hat. In other words, the gap is narrowing. 1900, one dollar for every $23. By 1910, one dollar for every $16. But remember now, this is a period where we had post-reconstruction, and then you had all the black codes and everything that were passed. And basically, because of economic envy, look at this improvement. Because of economic envy, it brought out the devil in a whole lot of people. The first lynching that Ida B. Wells documented was a lynching of a man named Tommy Moss. Now, Tommy Moss was a postman, was he a postman? In Memphis, Tennessee. This was about the best job a black person could get in about 1890, 1898 actually. He was a postman and he also started a grocery store called the People's Grocery Store. Why did he start a grocery store? Because the grocery store in the neighborhood where he lived was owned by a crazy white man who had 10 citations for selling liquor when he wasn't supposed to, had gambling in his store, and so black women especially felt safe there. So Tommy Moss said, you know, I can start my own store. And he did. Well, that's economic competition. And everybody's not up for that. So the man, and I, have, I, I always forget his name, and I, I refuse to write it down. I'm working on a book, and he'll, he'll be in the book, but I just, that man, every time I think about him, I get angry. Two little boys, black boy and white boy, were playing marbles, and the black boy won. The white boy ran to the man's store and said, the black boy stole my marbles. White men with shotguns went to Tommy Moss's store. Shotguns over marbles. Went to Tommy Moss's store, but brothers weren't having it. They had their own guns. So you, nothing really happened except for the fact that the white men then went to sheriff and said, Negroes have guns. The next thing you know, they were arrested. And it was three black men who were lynched. It's, uh, Tommy Moss was also the father of Ida B. Wells' um, godchild. She was a godmother to this young lady. And so she was both personally invested, but also she was a crusader for justice. So this was the first, this got her on the path of investigating lynchings. So she was, she was investigating lynchings, and this was the first one that she investigated. It was all about economic envy. There are so many other stories like that that's useful to know, I won't tell you about all of them, 
but you can think about Wilmington, North Carolina in 1898. This is a similar story. Black folks were doing very well in Wilmington. In fact, the black population outnumbered the white population, and there was a very large, very viable black middle class. Um, a, a brother named Alexander Manley edited the newspaper, and um, he owned the newspaper. Actually, he was biracial. It's rumored, but not proven, that his father was the governor of North Carolina, or had been a governor of North Carolina. But in any case, he was very light-skinned. I don't think he passed much, but he was able to get whites to support his newspaper until, until a white woman, she was the first woman to sit in the United States Senate, but a white woman gave a talk in Georgia and she said, we will lynch a thousand Negroes a day, and she didn't say Negroes, to, to protect our chastity. So Alexander Manley wrote an article, <laughs> I crack up whenever I think about it, that basically said, what chastity? Um, <laughs> I mean, that's what got Ida B. Wells in trouble, too. I mean, she basically said, uh, if you protest the, uh, your, your, your women so much, what are you protesting? Don't you trust them? Because, you know, the rape thing was always what would, would incense white men and would cause all kind of violence. But anyway, Manley wrote an editorial basically smacking this, giving this woman a, um, a smackdown and saying, uh, it's really, it's a cute editorial, because he says, if you see a comely lass with a Negro man, she recognized that he was handsome. It wasn't rape. So, but in any case, having said that, that was happening, and the other thing that was happening was the pastor and I were talking about it on the way over. At that time, the Republicans were the good guys. So the Republicans had aligned with black people to essentially, uh, it was called fusion politics, to essentially get more progressive people in City Hall. White folks were like totally afraid of that. First of all, black people in City Hall. So uh, the night before the election, they actually arrested all the prominent black men in the town, held them overnight so they could not vote, and the next morning gave them one-way tickets out of town. These men are, were wealthy, some were property owners, they just had to leave. They were, then, the white folks, basically, they were looking for Alexander Manley, and he was long gone because someone told him, you've got to get out of here if you want to stay alive. But they trashed his newspaper, and then they went to his, his newspaper offices, and then they literally went on a murdering rampage in Wilmington. There's a, a film, if you ever want to watch it, called Wilmington on Fire. It's on Vimeo, and it's really good. Um, I don't get any money for telling you all that. Uh, but I, I adore the, the folks who did the film because it's really it's a slice of history that we don't know. And that's the challenge, is that we don't know American history. Not black history, this is American history. So anyway, according to, the, they said that the, the, the folklore said that the uh, waters of the Wilmington River turned red, so many people were killed. However, folklore had, the, the, most historians said there were only 60 people killed, only 60, but, but there's a historian, a white guy from North Carolina, again, I just, totally adore the work he's done. He has documented over 1,100 people killed. 1,100 people killed in Wilmington, North Carolina. As a result of that, the um, black population obviously went down significantly. The number of black-owned businesses dropped by a third, um, and black people were cowed. Lynching is, and this is a form of lynching, but lynching is not only, it's an act of white oppression. It's an act that's designed to discourage people from fully participating in society, whether it's owning a business or anything else. So that was 1898. I was on the Red Summer. But these, some, of these, some of these cases are just so, I mean, I read them and I cry sometimes. Uh, some, sometimes I read, I go to the Library of Congress a lot and then they tell, they tell me I can't make noise in there. Um, so I mean, one time I was reading something and I said, oh no. Then I said, sookie, sookie now. Then I said something else, a library came. She said, uh, Dr. Malvo, you have, cannot come in here making all this noise. I said, read this. And after she read it, she said, sookie, sookie now. <laughs> but some of the cases are just so sad. And one of the things, again, the whole notion of interracial sex is really about white male insecurity. But when you look at some of the things that occurred, both white men and white women were oppressed by the trope that black folks were inferior. So one of the stories that Ida B. documented, this is the one where I literally cried, there was a black man uh, in Virginia, and he was, um, 
basically, people didn't have jobs like they have now. You had farms. You know, some people had jobs, but most people at that period, you know, they kind of bartered or whatever, especially black folks. So he, was a, he basically walked the highway or the road asking people if he could help them. And people would hire him to build their fence, to paint their house, whatever. Now, as a white woman who was a widow, and I understand that she was cute, that's what they said, um, and she had property. So all the white men in this town, or not all of them, I'm exaggerating slightly, but she was a very, considered a very desirable catch. Now, brother man and sister girl were getting it on. And people constantly ask, are you all in a relationship? And they, they said no, because she would have been killed. In, indeed, if she had admitted that they had a relationship. So, <laughs> I shouldn't laugh because it's not funny. One night, white men bust into her house and found the two of them in bed together. She got out of bed and cried rape. Because what, you know, I, I was talking to some of my friends who are feminist historians and they said, well, what else could she have done? I said, well, there are a few other things. But in any case, she cried rape and so they immediately took this brother tied him to a tree, um, and had kindling, kindling, kindling on him. Guess who struck the match to set him on fire? She did. And he said at Ida B. documents it, darling, would you do this to me after all I've been to you? And she struck the match anyway. So that was just that. It's amazing how many lynchings are accompanied by burnings. Which I don't, when we talk about lynchings, we just think about someone hanging from a tree, but the fact is that many of these people were burned alive. One of the most, um, I just wrote a piece called In the Name of Mary Turner. And Mary Turner was a black woman who was lynched. Where there were documented about almost 5,000 lynchings, and about 100 of them were lynchings of women. And again, we don't often talk about the lynchings of women. But the case of Mary Turner was really interesting. There was a evil white man in uh, Valdosta, Georgia, who basically was so mean he couldn't get anybody to work for him. So he would go to the prisons and bail people out, and then they had to work for him to work off their bail. So he did this, um, he always did it, and one man basically got tired of him because he beat the man, the man was sick, and he pulled a gun on him and told him you have to work whether you're sick or not. And so the man basically snapped and killed him. And not only killed him, shot his wife too, didn't kill her. Uh, she's probably just, just in a way, collateral damage. But in any case, he killed him. So anyone who was connected to this black man in a two week period was lynched. 14 people were lynched in a two week period, like a lynching a day. Uh, Mary Turner was 19 years old and she was nine months pregnant. Uh, she went to the courthouse and said she was gonna have justice for her husband. In the written record, they said they neither like, they didn't like her tone, her attitude, or the content of what she said. So they lynched her. So they took her, hung her upside down, lit her on fire, slit her belly, and when the fetus came out, almost fully formed baby, stomped the baby to death. How could somebody do this? These people went to church on Sunday. How could somebody do this? Well, first you have to thingify people. You have to make sure you, that you don't think these people are people, but instead they are things. And once you dehumanize people in your mind so that they're things and don't have feelings, then you can treat people as if they're things and don't have feelings. But economic envy was often at the root of much of this. All of you I'm sure know about Tulsa, Oklahoma, 1921, when Black Wall Street burned. Again, the beginning of that story was a story of so-called rape. A guy named Dick Rowland, who was 19 years old, and a girl named Sarah Page, who was 17, they were both orphans, interestingly, and there is some notion, Dick Rowland's mother, not adopted mother, said she thought, on the record, several times she said she thought that they had, had something to do with each other. In any case, in Tulsa, there was a, an orphan community, young people who didn't have much supervision, who hung out. Black and white, they just hung out. So anyway, Dick Rowland, the only place he could use the bathroom in downtown Tulsa, where he shines shoes for a living, was on a top floor of a building where Sarah Page was the elevator operator. Somehow he jostled her and she screamed. A white man witnessed it and went to the sheriff and said Dick Rowland raped Sarah Page. Sarah Page never would press charges against Dick Rowland, even well after the fact. 
She was pressured to say something happened, but she would never say it because nothing happened. He jostled her. However, that's what started. They, the headline of the newspaper said, to lynch a Negro tonight. To lynch a Negro tonight. That was the notice that everybody had. So of course, the black men in Tulsa, who were the bold, bodacious bunch, went to the sheriff's office and said, uh-uh, you're not gonna lynch this young man. They got him out of town, but there was some shots fired. And okay, too many black people had too many guns. So the next thing you know, literally, a 14 square block area was demolished. We had banks, we had churches. One of the churches had just paid off its mortgage when it was then burnt. Um, we had everything you needed. The black doctors in that town had come together to build a library because we couldn't go to the other libraries. All that was gone. And we were placed in concentration camp-like activities, basically a pinned-in area. They would not let people go. One of the things that was most humiliating, I have a friend, she's deceased now, Dr. Olivia Hooker. She was the last survivor of Tulsa. She died at 103. And I love to talk about Dr. Hooker. She was my bud. Um, she called me her soul sister because, not because soul, but because the soul's at the bottom of your feet. And the story was that uh, I was in, uh, where was I, Syracuse. And I had the cutest little workout outfit, but I forgot my shoes. So, and I have to walk. If I don't walk every other day or so, I just get real evil. So I understand that. And if I don't exercise, it, just, it doesn't turn out right. So I was in her room and I'm saying, and if I don't get a walk, I'm going to be one evil itch. And she said, what size shoes you wear? I said, 10. She said, please take my shoes because I don't deal with evil itches. <laughs> so after that, she always referred to me as her soul sister. But she um, talked about, she was uh, six years old when it happened and she talked about it a lot. One of the things that had, her dad owned the department store in Black Tulsa. Anyway, one of the things that happened is once people were incarcerated, pinned into this area, they wouldn't let you out unless a white person vouched for you. Many black women who were doctor's wives were forced to do maid's work. Again, that's economic envy. Y'all have too much, so we're going to knock you down a peg. Forced to do maid's work in order to get out of the area, to get out of the pinned-in area. Um, many doctors, physicians were forced to do manual labor. A white, that you had to get a white person, literally, to vouch for you. The governor of Oklahoma appointed a commission uh, to study why this uh, riot, they called it a riot, occurred. Uh, no one ever spent any time in jail, they, although people could be identified. But anyway, in the documents of why this riot occurred, one of the answers was too many ends, and it wasn't Negroes, have too much money. So that was, again, economic envy at the root of all this. Um, even though people were making progress, it was not even progress, and the majority of the African-American community actually was poor, but any visible sign of anything uh, essentially was uh, inci basically incited white anger. Um, so we fast forward, because I'm not going to stay on that. Fast forward to where we are today. Black people have $1 for roughly every $13 that white people have. One to 13, so we're not much better off than we were in 1910, when you think about it. It's one to 16, now one to 13. How come? Essentially because black folks were prevented from accumulating both through laws that discriminated, but also through actions that discriminated. The GI Bill, where a lot of us are talking about the GI Bill these days, because black men didn't have the advantages after serving in the military that white men did from the GI Bill. In the state of Mississippi, fewer than 600 black men were able to go to college on the GI Bill. What was fewer than 600 compared to the thousands who had served? When they would go to apply to go to college, the um, white folks who basically administer the GI Bill, you had to go in, in Mississippi, different states did it differently, but in Mississippi, you had to go before a board. And they would say to um, a brother man, you really don't want to go to college, why don't we t send you to barber school? You know, you really you know, don't need to go to college, why don't we send you to learn a trade? And so the result was that fewer than 600 black men ended up getting college degrees through the GI Bill. Now many did. Um, Andrew Brimmer, who was the first African-American to serve on the Federal Reserve Board Bank, got his doctorate 
uh, through the GI Bill. Whitney Young, uh, who was the president of the National Urban League at one time, got his doctorate through the GI Bill. So there were those who did, but they didn't come from Mississippi. Um, so so it's, it's just, when you look at the gaps, the gaps are a function of white supremacy, of illegal, uh, basically exclusive laws, um, and just plain old pure racism, plain old pure unadulterated racism. Which is why so many of us are at this time very interested in talking about reparations. And what I would hope would happen is that some of our white allies would also be willing to talk about reparations. Now most people start out the reparations conversation by saying, well how much? <laughs> well that's the last question, it's not the first question. The first question ought to be that there is a need for reparations. And indeed, uh, H.R. 40, which was uh, um, introduced by Congressman John Conyers um, first in 1989 and repeatedly until he left the Congress, and now Sheila Jackson Lee has taken it on. Um, but in any case, he introduced H.R. 40, which was a repara reparation study bill. He couldn't even get the whole Congressional Black Caucus to sign off on it because it's too controversial, um, too afraid. But now that we've had, uh, we've had a national hearing uh, where I was a witness, I lost my temper, um, I didn't mean to, um, but they kept asking Danny Glover economic questions. And I'm like, look, I'm an economist, y'all. If you want to answer the econ questions, ask me, uh, you know? Um, but in any case, uh, we have had hearings. Uh, Cory Booker introduced a similar piece of legislation in the Senate, so we now have it on both sides. Uh, we could pass it. I think, but it would, if it went to the Senate right now with the turtle from, whatever, never mind. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Well, the turtle from Kentucky is what I usually call him. Uh, that's not nice. Um, and my boo says, he says, don't, you don't have to do all that name calling. I'm like, yeah, I do, uh, sometimes. But in any case, he's not gonna let anything out of the Senate, you know, not even impeachment, which he should, but that's another story. Um, Y'all didn't bring me here to talk about impeachment, and we all, whatever. But in any case, uh, <laughs> reparations is important, not only because we're talking about individual repair, but also because we're talking about community repair. And if you look at what's happened in the African American community, you can see the need for repair. Once upon a time, there were more than 100 black-owned banks in this country. Now there are 23. What happened? Well, among other things, banking laws changed. Among other things, uh, every now and then there was some inefficiency involved as well, but many of these banks were small and easy to have inefficiency, but uh, regulations and things were changed, and sometimes the regs were designed to squeeze out small banks, and black banks tended to be small banks. The story that I think about when I think about banking is the story of Maggie Lena Walker. She was the first black woman to charter a bank. We thought she was the first woman, but there was a white woman in Texas who used her husband's money so it kind of doesn't count. Um, so she, you know, I mean, but anyway, she independently chartered this bank. It was called Penny Savings Bank. Maggie Lena was actually extraordinarily brilliant and had major foresight. So Maggie Lena, uh, right before the Depression, she felt something was going on. So she got two other small banks in Richmond, Virginia to consolidate. So the bank became consolidated savings bank, from Penny Savings Bank to Consolidated Savings Bank. That bank was successful from 1903 until 2005 when it failed. Uh, partially because, again, of changing regulations, uh, partially because of some inefficiency. Uh, oftentimes, black-owned banks experience extreme pressure from the community. They go to the community and say, invest in us, and then the community says, invest in us back. But, you know, good banking is good banking. So in the case of uh, Consolidated, some bad loans were given, unfortunately, including loans to churches. Um, and basically, when they defaulted, the bank got in trouble. They were bailed out twice, and it didn't stick, so moving right along. The interesting thing about that, that, that the Maggie Lena, there was a guy who was, uh, and their story is so interesting, because they knew each other, they might have had something to do with each other, I'm not sure, because there was a, a, some tension between the two of them. This man named John Mitchell, he, like Maggie Lena, was a newspaper publisher and a banker, and he's very active in the community. But he was one of these brothers who just couldn't do the down low thing. In other words, he was one of the first black men to own an automobile in Richmond. He wore four coats. 
You know, white folks were not feeling that. They truly were not feeling that. I mean, he was rather ostentatious. And so in one of where Maggie Lena was a light-skinned woman, kind of large and non-threatening uh, to white folks, he just was in folks' face. And so actually there's some correspondence where a white banker writes Maggie Lena and says, and why does he have to be so ostentatious? And she basically said, I don't know. That's how he is. That's how he had been much of his life. His bank failed. There was an opportunity for the majority bank to help, but they wouldn't because they didn't like him. Uh, unfortunately, the black folks didn't really like him that much either. Some of the other black banks were at that time asked to bail, help bail him out, and they were like, mm-mm. So, but in any case, again, here we have this strand of economic envy, and we have, and why are black banks so important? I mean, putting your money in Bank of America, Wells Fargo, whatever, whatever. Putting your money wherever it makes your money safe, but black banks tend to give more loans to black folks. So home ownership, in fact, Maggie Lena Walker's bank was credited with the growth of the black middle class in Richmond because they gave out so many home loans. Where other banks, there was a time when white banks would not lend to black people. They would not even take your deposits. And that's one of the reasons that Penny was started, Penny Savings Bank was started, because the white banks wouldn't take your deposits. What people had to do often was put their deposit in the name of a white person. But see, I'm not trusting white folks like that. So, you know, you gave your money to James Jones, and James Jones put your money in a bank, and then James Jones has a little hard time. James Jones takes your money, and what can you do? So, um, basically, the black-owned banks do a lot. And frankly, for some of you who are, you know, our friends and associates and allies, take, get a checking account at a black-owned bank. Ain't gonna hurt you, and it helps them. So invest in a black-owned bank. You know, there are lots of things, small things that people can do. You know, reparations is a huge thing, but there's small things. But anyway, H.R. 40 and the Senate bill, I forget Corey's bill, are really important, and there have been hearings. Um, and as I said, the biggest issue is community repair. It's not writing in, I, I get in fights with some of the young people, they well, well we're gonna get $10,000 a piece. First of all, 10,000 would not cover it. But secondly, it's not about people getting a check, it's really about community repair. It's about fully funding our historically black colleges and universities. There are four HBCUs in the state of Maryland that by court investigation were found to have been underfunded to the tune of more than a billion dollars. Uh, Governor Hogan has offered 200 million. The, the folks who are bringing the lawsuit, the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law, actually came up with a compromise of 577 million, and Co Hogan came back and said, y'all can have 200 million and that's it. And over a 10 year period, so that's like $20 million a year over a 10 year period, and it's for HBCU, so it's like $5 billion a piece. It's like pennies, it's insulting. But this, you know, basically, the issue of owing, of looking at what is owned and what is owed, is very uncomfortable for lots of folks. Where is the money gonna come from? We find it to do anything else we wanna do. You know, who should pay? I didn't have any slaves. I just got here. I, I, I'm an immigrant. I just came here. I shouldn't have to pay for something that happened 400, 300, 200 years ago. Yeah, you do, because you benefited. The, the foundation of our banking system, the foundation of our entire country, if you come to Washington and look at all those pristine white buildings, enslaved people did that. Enslaved people built that. That's why I call the White House the house that enslaved people built, uh, because we kept, need to keep reminding ourselves of this history. And it's a history that too many people forget. So what can well-meaning people do about the economic situation? One thing is to support H.R. 40. H.R. 40 is not a bill that says we're going to write checks. It's a bill that says let's study. It's a, we used to call it a study bill, but now it's a study and action bill. So we'll study what happened and then recommend some things so that we could then have a national discussion. See, we've been avoiding having this conversation since black folks have been here. And we've certainly been avoiding it since the passage of the Civil Rights Act. We seem, some people seem to think that passing the Civil Rights Act is sufficient, but it's not. It's, it's a piece of legislation. Uh, like Dr. King said one time, the law cannot make you love me, but it can keep you from lynching me. Um, but in any case, and, and, and that's true, but the, the, the law does not make, does not create equality. Really, it's structures and institutions that can help us get to equality. 
One of the most interesting conversations about reparations I had was from, with a, a young white guy. I gave, gave a lecture and afterwards he came and he said, well, but what do you say about Oprah Winfrey? I'm like, uh, well, if Oprah took her millions and divided them among 40 million black people, everybody have five dollars. So I'm not going to deal with the, you know, you obviously have exceptionalism, Bob Johnson, you can call the names, Robert Smith, who just bailed out uh, young people at Morehouse College. You can call the names, but that's not equality. It's not structural equality. So, I mean, people need to be social justice activists, and part of that is economic justice. I mean, we, we talk about laws, we talk about rights, but the economic piece makes everybody basically uncomfortable. Because really now you're talking about, but, you know, in America, any conversation about money makes people at some level uncomfortable. People will tell you how many times they had sex, but they won't tell you how much money they make. I mean, <laughs> seriously, people talk about, you know, their sexual exploits very easily. How much money do you make? Well, um, um, uh, <laughs> they don't want to talk about that. And, that. and that's one of the peculiarities. That's why you end up with so much inequality in the workplace, because people are not transparent about what they earn, and salaries are not public. So you can be sitting right next to someone doing the very same work, and y'all will be getting different rates of pay. And this happens all the time. And only when salaries are acknowledged and people know what they are can you really start talking about equality. But people, that, they, that makes people extraordinarily uncomfortable. But in any case, back to, back to reparations. I mean, I think it's something that we just need to put our heads around to talk about. First of all, there has never even ever been really a national apology for enslavement. We've never really talked about an apology for enslavement. And when you look at some of the things that occurred, not only in enslavement, but after these lynchings that I told you about, the Mary Turner, um, these happened after uh, enslaved people were freed. But again, because there were so many white Southerners who basically were accustomed to thingifying black people and wanting to, you know, some, one, one man was lynched in Florida because he had an automobile. Another, you know, there were all, I don't know how many lynchings because people did not step off the sidewalk for a white person. Uh, reckless eyeballing, looking at a white woman. Um, there was a veteran from World War II who was blinded, blinded because he refused to um, get off a bus. It was a military bus. He refused to get off the bus because he felt he had a right to be there. He was a veteran. He fought for this country, blinded. The, the, the amount of evil in this country is just huge, the amount of racial evil. Now, I don't say this to make anybody feel guilty because I don't care whether people feel guilty or not. I say it's because we don't understand the history. And so many of us have not read the history. And I don't blame anybody for not knowing the history when I was an uh, un undergrad, when I was in high school, the history book had two black people in it. One of them looked like she had escaped from one of those uh, Aunt Jemima commercials, and the other one looked like he was uh, masquerading as Uncle Ben. Um, two black people's pictures in a whole history book that was about 400 pages long. And the uh, section on enslavement was only three pages. And there, there, was, a, there was a book that was written that many white people were using in their history book, and it talked about happy slaves. So, you know, basically, these distortions of history are what we have to grapple with. And again, it doesn't mean that anyone has to feel guilty. It means that people have to talk about change and how, essentially, you change things. And not many people, like I said, you, you know, people will pass legislation. People will go, go outside. I love people singing, we shall overcome. They say, we shall overcome someday. I have issues with that. What day? You know? I mean, you know, was, I was a, when I was a college professor, I didn't tell students you could pay, turn your paper in someday. You know, there was a day that you had to turn your paper in. You know, when a fine brother ro rose up on me, I'm going to call you someday? Uh-uh, brother. If you don't call me within the next 24 hours, next. Uh, you know? I mean, we put deadlines on everything else. So why don't we put a deadline of, on we, when we overcome? Now, I mean, it's a rhetorical song and all that good stuff, but people love to sing it this way, oh. <laughs> you know, they feel it. But what do they feel about changing it? And so that's really kind of where we are. The unfortunate thing about 45 is that he has unleashed a period of pure hatred in this country. 
You see people wearing those MAGA hats, make America great again. Well, when was America ever really, truly great? I mean, this is these people who want to go backwards, but I don't want to go backwards. We have to go forward. But so we've seen the, the shootings, uh, shootings in churches and synagogues. This man has just unleashed all this hate, but unleash means it was already there. It did not start with that man. It had been there before, which is kind of undercover. Um, even when President Obama was president, it was interesting at the number of folks who were uncomfortable with the black president. Michelle Obama used to routinely get uh, criticized. She was ape looking. Joan Rivers said, called her a tranny. Um, I know where she's burning. But anyway, um, I mean, she got all kinds of hatred. The president himself got all kinds of hatred. So this man just makes it okay to hate. Before these folks would do hateful things, but they whisper. They just whisper. Now they don't mind. They do it out loud. And the challenging thing is that so-called good people don't challenge them because the people want to go along to get along. If people basically check people on their nonsense, just even verbally, you would be ima you imagine how things might change. I have a friend who's extraordinarily light-skinned. She could pass. In fact, she used to. Um, well, she, pa she passes when it's convenient, put it that way. Um, but she, anyway, what she said to me was that she, she, uh, she worked in, in state government in L.A. She worked in L.A. And she said when her co-workers were having lunch, she'd just sit there and listen to them and listen to them talk ugly about black people. And she wouldn't check them. Finally, she said she had to come out of the closet, admit that she was black, admit. Um, when somebody said something that was just so filed, she's like, well, you know, wait a minute. You know, I'm black too. And they didn't believe her. Then they said, well, you know, uh, this is a white part of you that makes you so successful. You know, just like uh, the young lady who works on Morgan, um, who works on NBC News. She interviewed some Klansmen, and that's what he, he said. Well, you know, the reason that you're so smart is because you mixed. Nonsense. But again, when do we check people on stuff? When do we say that this is our history, that we own our history, that there was unfairness in history, but we can fix it? When do we say that we basically reject racism? And it's not a black people thing. White people have to say that. See, that's the issue. When I talk about race, oh, you're stuck on race. Oh, you're defensive. It takes white folks to confront white folks to deal with racism and to dismantle it. So what I want to do today, I mean, I've been all over the place, not really, kind of. But what I want to do today is to challenge y'all. I mean, this Moon Lecture ought to give you incentive to do a couple of things. One, to read black economic history. And if you wait till next year, my new book will be out. But, uh, <laughs> but in any case, to read about black economic history, to read about, just to inform yourself and to inform your young people. And it's not just about the South, by the way, because Northern industrialists gained as much from enslavement as Southern plantation owners did. All that cotton that was picked was sent up to New England. So the, the exploitation all around. So, uh, oftentimes, and, and, and guess what else? They had enslavement in New England. Not a lot, but there, people are now beginning to discover some of the enslaved people were held by some of the most progressive white families in New England. So let's not just dwell on the South. But anyway, number one, read some black economic history. Um, read Ibrahim, uh, his book, Marked, from, Marked by Oppression. Uh, did, just read some of this stuff. Why? Again, not to feel bad, but to be knowledgeable. The second thing that I would say to you is to talk to folk about race matters, not just to black folk, but also other white folk. Think about ways that you can bring multiracial groups together to have the conversation. People get defensive, of course, but after, but you know, you get defensive and then if people find that you really are well-meaning and really want to address some of these issues, they'll have the conversation. So think about the conversations that you can have. And thirdly, and most importantly, teach your children and your grandchildren well. So many young people don't know because it's not in their school, it's not in their books, so you must tell them. The reason that we have such ignorance is because folks haven't told people. I think about Dylan Roof, and when I think about Dylan Roof, I shudder. 
The boy was only 20 some years old, 20, when he went and um, shot up that church in uh, South Carolina. Where did he learn how to hate like that? See, when I see old racists, I kind of don't care about them because they're going to die soon. Uh, but when you get younger, they, they, these people are going to be around. So, you know, we've got to teach our young people how to respect and how to love. By the word, one of my least fa by the way, one of my least favorite words is tolerance. Well, we have tolerance for others. Well, that's kind of like you're holding your nose. I'll, I'll tolerate you. Nah. Include me. Respect me. Don't tolerate me. That just, I mean, so when people talk about tolerance, I really want to say, what are you really talking about? Is this something that doesn't come natural? Accepting other human beings in all their history ought to come natural. And then, you know, don't think the smile means somebody's smiling. Paul Lawrence Dunbar said, we wear the mask that grins and lies, that hides our cheeks and shades our eyes. Dunbar really talked about the fact that while many black people are seething under the surface, they will smile, they'll go along to get along, they, but they know what's going on and they don't like it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, wow. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Okay, we have time for some questions. So please, if you have a question to ask Dr. Malvo, please raise your hand or try and attract my attention somehow. I'd prefer you didn't stand up on the pew and shout, but you know, just raise a hand or something. That would be great. Yeah. Good evening, uh, Dr. Melvo. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to uh, go into your background in labor e economics just a little. Are you familiar with a, uh, a program that was developed in the 1960s called the Freedom Budget? Yes. Don't you think that's part of what we need today to address the issues of inequality? Absolutely. Uh, the Congressional Black Caucus, until very recently, right about the last decade, used to do an alternative budget. It, the alternative budget was first led by Ron Dellums, Congressman Ron Dellums, when he was in the Congress, amazing man. Um, but he, um, he developed an alternative budget. Uh, Reverend William Barber has a budget that's called the Moral Budget that also talks about um, basically how we, we can structurally deal with some things. You know this F. 15 bomber, um, which doesn't work, by the way. No, it doesn't work. I mean, they, and, and it's short on parts and all this stuff, but it costs billions of dollars. Imagine how that money could be used for any number of other things. Actually, <laughs> this is funny. So Army asked for like 70 of them, and Congress said, well, no, we'll give you 90. You know, we don't even need them. So yeah, I, I guess you're absolutely right. An alternative budget would make a lot of uh, sense. Thank you for tonight. Um, next Wednesday, I'm driving from Memphis to Vicksburg, but I'm going to go on the Arkansas side. And <laughs> we're, um, when I talked with the people at the, inter at the internment interpretive center for the Rohr and Jerome internment camps, I said I'd like to go through Elaine, Arkansas and by Hoop Spur. We're 100 years and 10 days from um, another horror story there. Yeah of black farmers, I guess, sharecroppers, tenant farmers, Over organizing in a them, church, yeah. mm -hmm. um, and, and mass murder resulted. Uh, yeah. You know, a longer story that Ida Wells Well, the, 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 But it is about economic envy again, because these it, men exactly. were trying to organize, because if they could organize, they could get better um, prices for their crops. Right. So, so my question is, what does reparations look like in rural areas and with black farmers in rural communities now? What, what would they look what like? What would reparations kind of, what would be the shape of that for restoring communities and families? I mean, I think that first of all, we want to talk about the land that was stolen. The emergency land fund uh, documented the, the millions of acres that were stolen from black folks 
Um, so we want to do something about that, and I don't know where there have been. Any, public, any land that's publicly owned, I think at some level should be used as a possibility and a foundation uh, for reparations. And in cities where you have large unused areas, but you see gentrification running black folks out, those are areas that you have to have either low or mixed use housing. So, you know, I haven't, those of us who are a part of refer, reparations activism really have focused on H.R. 40 and the Senate bill and really don't get into what does it look like for this community or that. But I would think that in the rural areas, a big piece of it would be the land. Good evening, Dr. Malvo. Thank you for coming. We're honored, uh, enlightened uh, at your scholarship and your courage. I'd like to know about your educational trajectory. What led you into economics? <laughs> Thank you. Um, and that's my dear friend, Faiz Ali. Um, so used to be at the Sacramento Bee. I think now she's retired and living her life like it's golden. Uh, <laughs> but um, how did I pick economics? The, the short version of a long story is that I, when I pledged Delta Sigma Theta sorority, everybody wants to go to law school, and I'm contrarian essentially. So, I mean, literally, undergrad, I majored in econ. I, I actually did a paper uh, freshman year, and I typed the paper and typed all these mathematical equations, and the professor said, gee, you should be an econ major. You're really good at this. So I majored in econ thinking, actually, that I would either go to law school or J school, journalism school, and basically my interests are so varied that I end up doing most of the things except for law and with public policy. I, you know, I applied to, like, econ, public policy, J school, um, MBA, that would have been a disaster. Um, and anyway, ended, ended up at econ. Um, ended up at MIT because MIT at the time had, was looking for black folks. Uh, they had found a whole four of us, but, um, <laughs> but they were three, but because I went to Boston College undergrad and MIT grad students would always often come over and say, gee, this is a possibility. They gave me good money, so. Uh, actually, the summer of my first year of grad school, I, did, I had a TV job at WFAA in Dallas, Texas, the ABC station, and um, I liked it. I, I called my mom. I said, you know, I think I'm going to stay down here and whatever, and she called the station manager, and so then he told me, the man's name was Marty Haig, he said, you can't stay here. Go back to school. I'm like, what happened? He said, you like my work. <laughs> he said, well, I think you'd be more effective if you finish school. I'm, okay. That was my mom interfering. But, um, and, and as an economist, I've been all over the place as well. I mean, I do TV, radio, I do some economic research, but less than I used to. Um, I'm writing a book on black money, tentatively titled Black Money, Then, Now, and in the Future. So Maggie Lena has a chapter in there, well, black banking has a chapter in there. But um, intellectual curiosity has led me to a lot of places. And thank you for the question. Good evening, Dr. Malvo. You mentioned early in your talk. Um, oh, there you are. Okay. Here I am. <laughs> you mentioned early in your talk that uh, white men and women are also oppressed by the, the trope of black inferiority. And the, the way I have thought about that in the past is uh, that each time opportunity is expanded, everybody's got to up their game. Yeah. Because the folk who are, um, the folk who have been held down have to work harder. Mm -hmm. to, to make it, but then that means everybody else has got to up their game, and so that's a, a loss to white folks who haven't had to bother to work that hard to up their game. Would you comment? Are you talking about the person who sits in the Oval Office? <laughs> <laughs> Who's always talking about hard work but got $2 million uh, a year or something like that when he was a kid? Anyway, um, I think you're absolutely right. I, I, well, I think oppression some people feel it more, but everybody experiences some aspect of it. Uh, think about, uh, what, I mean, I, think about marriage as an example. Think about the people who were not able to be with who they loved. And I'm not just talking about, you know, across racial lines, but, you know, until very recently, gay marriage was not allowed. So how many people basically have had to hide their love? That's oppression. You know, that's oppression. So there, I, I agree with your point. I think it's very well taken. Good evening, Dr. Monroe. Hi. Hi. Uh, uh, you mentioned earlier that there was a 13 to 1 wealth gap between the African American community and the majority community. What specific steps or remedies would you uh, recommend as an economist 
to lower that, to reduce that uh, gap significantly? Reparations. Um, <laughs> uh, but actually, investment in community. A lot of people think that personal finance will lead you to economic justice. It will not. Personal finance, is use, it's useful for us to be more efficient with our resources. It's useful for us not to be exploited by predatory lenders. But if every black person ne never spent another penny on anything but necessities, we wouldn't close the wealth gap. So basically, what did I call it? it um, external infusions of cash. And that, that's my nice way of saying reparations. But from government could do a lot more not only federal, but state and local governments in terms of investment. Um, corporations could do more in terms of investment. Um, there was a time when corporations actually did look at, for example, depositing in black-owned banks. And that impetus is gone. A lot of people feel like we had the 60s and maybe the 70s, and gee, if you don't have equality now, what's your problem? Well, enslavement began in 1619 and was basically the law of the land for another 200 years. So that's, you know, that's literally the issue. But basically, inf infusions of cash in wealth building institutions. So it's not infusions of cash to individuals, infusions of cash to banks, to health systems, to things like that. I mean, we're still, when you talk about the reverberations of inequality, the health situation becomes really uh, critical. This is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Fannie Lou Hamer died of undiagnosed breast cancer. And although black women and white women get breast cancer at about the same rate, black women are about 40% more likely to die and sooner than white women are. Now, part of that is lack of access to health care. And people don't get uh, their mammograms. A lot of people don't get mammograms. Um, so, but but th th some of those inequalities are hardwired. So we're not just looking at dollars. We're looking at external infusions. I appreciate this so much tonight, and I especially appreciate you starting with Sankofa um, and understanding history. And I think there's another part of history that people, a lot of people aren't aware of. They, we talk about rep reparations as if that's something unique to us, but actually it isn't. And, and history shows us that after slavery, as long as the money lasted, a lot of slave owners who benefited from slavery took advantage of, of reparations. And I wanted you to speak to some to that tonight because I don't know that people are aware of it. That, that's such a good point. When, when enslavement was abolished in Washington, D.C., those who owned uh, enslaved people were able to get $300 for every enslaved person that was freed. Um, and as you said, at the end of world, uh, the war, at the end of the Civil War, uh, those who lost their lands and their staff were compensated until the as you say, until the money ran out. Um, so you're, you're right, there are precedents, but the, you know, it's, it's just ironic that you would pay the people who enslaved, but not pay the people that they enslaved. Thanks for raising that. Has there been any effort for Asian Americans to unionize, particularly the way we treated Japanese Americans? Did, was there any effort to, to form unions? Specifically for Asian American people? Yeah. Not to my knowledge. Um, no, not to my knowledge. Um, I've always been interested in um, the impact of the GI Bill for building white uh, suburbs and the fact that uh, they didn't make home loans readily available to people of color. And um, I, I was wondering if you would just say a few words about that. I'm not sure that I'm that well informed, but I'm curious. 
There's a book, uh, the guy's name is, I think his last name is Katz Nelson, but it, the book is titled when Affirmative, when Affirmative Action Was White. And it looked at the many ways that white people benefited from things like the GI Bill, the uh, Fair Housing Act. Um, the Federal Housing Administration actually uh, was responsible for redlining, in other words, drawing areas where they would not lend, also would not lend in areas that were integrated. So basically uh, solidifying segregation. But um, the GI Bill really was responsible, if you look at the data, uh, demographic data, responsible for the um, development of the white middle class. Until that period, only a small percentage of the population, of white population, could be considered middle class. But that GI Bill really brought a lot of white folks into the middle class and didn't bring black folks either. Brought some, but, not, not, but far fewer. I have a question about um, reparations for the, well, actually probably millions of uh, black folks who have ended up in jail. We still have slavery. And yeah. what, uh, what does this look like? Yeah, we do still have a form of, you know, when I talked about Mary Turner and the guy who got his workers uh, basically out of jail, you have manufacturing that occurs inside jails. You have profit make, predatory profit makers who are making money from people's labor and they're not being paid for it. Um, people get paid pennies a day as incarcerated people, pennies an hour rather, not a day. Well, they, still that would be pennies a day, whereas uh, they'd have to pay workers real wages. What will reparations look like for people who have been incarcerated? First of all, well, I think the first thing we've got to do with incarcerated people is take away the stigma of incarceration. So once people have paid their, done their time, they pay their fine, they've done everything, let them get back into regular society. There are probably, depending on the state, over 150 occupations that you can't hold if you've been incarcerated. One in, in Illinois is barbers. Now, what is incarceration? What's the correlation? Now, I can understand if you commit a bank fraud and they don't let you become a treasurer or an auditor. But <laughs> a barber? So, but I'm not really, you know, as I said about reparations, I really haven't looked at certain subsets of the population. At this point, those of us who are basically involved in the movement are looking at the passage of legislation and then how it might break out. So that would be certainly something that I would think a commission would study. Could you talk a little more widely about uh, the economic dimensions uh, of so much incarceration and the criminal justice system, the way that it's operating? You know, that's such a good question because, again, ju just like enslavement is hardwired into our system, so too is incarceration. And the, I mean, if you look at Parchman Farm in Mississippi, this was a farm where people basically were living in conditions that were just like enslavement. They were farming. Uh, it, some of the food went to f feed the pr other prisoners, but some of it was sold. Um, so we, you have to look at, uh, like, Corrections Corporation of America is a publicly traded corporation that runs several private prisons. So now, once you say publicly traded, what are you talking about? You're talking about profit maximization. Because profit maximization means resource minimization. So some of these prisons, as an example, have horrible food, horrible diets, limited health care, all of that, but they're making a profit and often they're doing manufacturing. Um, legislators really need to look at this. Uh, in the name of efficiency, you've seen a growth in the private prison system because basically legislators said that the public prison system was inefficient, uh, and perhaps it was, but what the private prison system, the private profit-making prison system does is oppress us. You may be interested to know, you probably didn't hear that this afternoon Governor Newsom signed a bill making it illegal as of 2028 for there to be any privately owned prisons in California. I love it. Thank you. Um, I have so many questions I could keep you here another hour and a half. But, um, the one that's, that keeps coming back is you talked about changing how white people look at real history, 
how they actually embrace slavery, and then eventually how they come to accept some form, you know, approach reparations and then embrace it. Um, but we always got to get to the point where how do you tweak white minds? And do you recommend, um, so I see it as a chicken and the egg thing. I don't know that you can have a, an academic discussion with Bureau of Labor Statistics. We don't live in a fact-based era for <laughs> right now. But, I mean, a dream vacation to me, my wife doesn't know this, or may, maybe I brought it up once, would be to roam the South and uh, get tours of plantations and then force seditious conversations about these beautiful mansions and these beautiful fields. And, hey, what about the slaves? Because I've read a couple of accounts now where these tours are being overturned by seditious Yankees, not the ones swinging baseball bats, who want to force these conversations. And people are saying, well, that makes me uncomfortable. Why do you want to bring that up? Almost like it is a, the three pages worth of slavery that you saw that you saw in your history books. So the chicken and the egg I'm talking about is do we, do we try to get other white folks to look at this from an academic economic standpoint or do we have to get attitudinal first? Like everything you learned was crap and now I'm going to start to teach you something that's not crap. Is that <laughs> too high handed or is it work better with facts? Your opinion. Well, I think it's both end. I don't think it's either. I think it's a both and kind of situation. The more you know, the more you're curious about it, the more you know sometimes, the, the more your attitudes will change. Your point that you make is really interesting. There's been a little controversy at Monticello, uh, where Jefferson lived. And they have started, in, they found an area where a uh, small bedroom where Sally Hemings stayed. Sally Hemings, of course, was his black mistress that he did not claim. He had a bunch of kids by her. And some of the Jefferson family has accepted this and basically I embraced it, but others are like, no, they weren't his kids, they were probably his brother's kids, um, you know, denial. But uh, when Monticello has started um, including more of the black history, more of the history of enslavement, and actually white folks have been real, very resistant. So writing letters saying, one woman actually wrote a letter to the Washington Post that she didn't really need to have all that with her history. She went on vacation to see Monticello because she thought it would be an enjoyable experience. It was not enjoyable for her to hear about enslavement. And so like, get over it, lady. But, uh, <laughs> but in any case, I, I think it's a both end. Good evening. My question is more along the lines of education. I think that an awful lot of the problems we have right now is in this developed country is that we just have done a poor job of educating our young people and our adults. We can't agree on climate change with the fires in Southern California or the deserts uh, without water. I, I guess my point is, are you or any of the Black Caucus working with the Department of Education, <laughs> given who heads it, in any way of to to push because because I sit here and I'd like to think I'm educated and there were stories tonight that I have never heard and I'm a voracious reader and I think to myself oh my gosh the lack of knowledge that I have about race relations or race uh, in our society um, is just abysmal and so I guess my question really is what can we do to um, raise the level uh, in our society because I think that's where a lot of our problems come from. It's just plain and simple ignorance. Well, I fully agree with you. Uh, the woman who leads the Department of Education, I call her Betsy Devoid because she's <laughs> devoid of good sense. Um, and the way that, she, well, one of the ways to change education is to conscious progressive people need to be on school boards. Um, people, need to, people need to go to school board meetings, whether you have children or not, uh, and basically get involved. One of the things that happens in our society is that so many, um, you have the, like maybe three or four major textbook uh, producers, and um, so there's not a lot of variety, but a lot of teachers actually end up augmenting the textbooks with other things. But how come we can't have better textbooks? 
So I think that involvement at the school board level can often make a difference there. And we do need, I mean, the, the lack of education in our society is really kind of frightening. As you say, we, the climate change deniers, while you see climate change right in front of your face, um, you know, make, it makes no sense. And it's a world issue that other countries are so far ahead of us that we are. Um, it's, it's, it, you know, again, but see, the bottom, the bottom line of all this stuff is what I call predatory capitalism. And predatory capitalism essentially allows you to thingify people, you put profits over people, and essentially, and so you see in the last 50 years, certainly, the inequality in our country has grown significantly. And a, a, a lot of that is just about the ability to thingify. So I think that, you know, we, we, talking about dismantling capitalism to an MIT trained economist is kind of challenging. <laughs> they didn't teach socialism at MIT. Um, but, in any, but, but, but we have to really talk about how the economic system can work for all of us. And that's the dilemma. Thank you for being here, Dr. Malvo. Could you talk um, a little about the impact of the state of Texas uh, and what it uh, has had on the um, content of school textbooks? The a content of what? The content of school textbooks. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, Texas is oversized, and it has a huge influence in what, um, what our textbooks look like. Um, and the size, I mean, California should actually have equal, equal um, influence, but it doesn't, and I'm not sure why. So um, Texas is also interesting because of the Bushes and the things that they did around education, and we can look at um, any number of pieces of legislation that have moved us away from real education and toward te standardized testing, and that's a Bush thing. Uh, so more, more and more standardized tests are used to measure our young people's efficiency, but we don't teach them then how to do critical thinking. We teach them how to pass multiple choice tests. And again, that came, Rod, what was his name? Rod Page was the uh, Secretary of Education under Big Bush. Um, and obviously Big Bush didn't do enough about education because Shrub didn't have a lot of sense either. Uh, <laughs> But anyway, I don't think I fully answered your question, but basically, I think I came close. <laughs> Do you think the Green New Deal is a um, vehicle for economic infusions? And I mean, particularly because poor and communities of color are being impacted you know, greatly by climate change. So you, did you, what did you ask? I mean, the first part, did uh, I the, think? It, the, do you think the Green New Deal is a, is no. a, you know, a, a vehicle for m making some of these changes, these economic changes that would oh. bolster communities of color? And I think the Green New Deal is interesting, um, and I basically support it, but what they've done is put everything in there but the kitchen sink. And that, that's a problem with it. It needs to be better focused legislation. But, I th you know, this administration actually eliminated the uh, environmental justice uh, section of the EPA, which basically did deal with uh, pollution. Um, and the impact that all this stuff has on communities of color, marginalized communities. Um, you know, there was, when I was in Greensboro with the college, there was, um, the, right next to the black community, there was a, a waste processing plant, and they burnt that stuff. And it smelled bad. But not only did it smell bad, but people began to study, you know, the cancer effects and all of this. And, you know, people just took for granted. That's, what, that's how you normalize inferiority. Took for granted that that plant should be in the hood. You know, they wouldn't have thought of putting it in some area, you know, redolent with greens and all of that, but they should have. So I think that the Green New Deal has lots of potential. I think that it's almost inevitable. If we if we want to um, have a planet, then we have to really think about how we preserve it. And so, you know, Reverend Barber, uh, Dr. King talked about the triple evils being um, racism, militarism, and poverty. But Reverend Barber has expanded that to have to five things, and one is uh, environmental, you know, devastation, he calls it environmental devastation. But his fifth thing is the crisis of the church. And he talks about basically the so-called 
God-fearing people who thump their Bible Sunday and oppress people Monday. And so, so he, but so he's, exp I, I look up to that man so much. He, he really is a modern manifestation of Dr. King. Dr. Mavo, th thank you so much for being here and for your voice being as strong as it has been for many years. Um, and I, I, I think about the, getting back to the original issue, one issue that you were talking about earlier, is how uncomfortable people, particularly black people and white people, are talking to each other about this and seeking ways together and trying to get past the, the fears. and. So are you, do you have some suggestions or some feelings about how we can inspire a great deal more of that dialogue that would then, then would enable us to, to move toward progress? I feel that the, the political climate right now is so polarized and so ugly that we can't even have the discussions, we can't even come to a conclusion about what's really going on, what's really, what really is needed. So I'm, I'm interested in what you think about ways that people can become more comfortable in talking about uncomfortable things and understanding that that's a necessary process? Great question. Couple things. First of all, you have to create safe spaces. I think lots of white people are afraid to offend. Um, and sometimes they say things that frankly are stupid, but they should be able to say stupid things and for someone to say, well, gee, that was kind of not too bright. Why do you think that way? as opposed to saying, oh, you're a racist, I'm storming out of here. So you have to create safe spaces to have that conversation. I find that one of the ways to have those kinds of conversations is to use a book or a common reading. So that people, so you're really not then talking about your feelings, although your feelings will come out, you're talking about a, a book. To Kill a Mockingbird is, as an example, a really great book. Uh, but there are others um, that, that, that basically can lay the foundation. Uh, you, you talked about us not being able to get along, and I, I have to say something. When you elect a clown, expect a circus, you know? I, I, and what I mean by that is that all, all this in, in, impeachment conversation, uh, Syria conversation, they're important conversations, but meanwhile, regulations are being turned back by the minute, literally by the minute. And so we you talk about labor laws, you know, the uh, National Labor Relations Board doesn't, is, isn't operating now because it doesn't have a full contingent. Um, and I think one other, but in any case, the, the, regu the regulatory piece is as important as trying to stop this man and all his antics because it's just not him. It's the others, and then you, the judiciary is frightening as well because not only has he found some young judges, but young dumb judges. I mean, it's a white woman who's 39 and has only tried one case in her lifetime, now she's a federal judge. Okay. 39, never tried a case. Or you, the, the, the other guy, the, now that one was funny. I forgot the guy's name, but he couldn't even answer questions from Republicans. They finally withdrew. I mean, Roland Martin keeps playing a little piece of it where the guy says, oh, I don't know. Well, I don't need that. Well, I don't know. Um, they finally withdrew his nomination, which was appropriate. But that, you, you talk about just publicly dumb. And usually people, you know, before you have those kind of hearings, they vet you, they, they, they prepare you. So, you know, what do you say? Hi. Hi. You talked a little bit earlier about the intersection of race and gender mm -hmm. when you talked about women's health care. Expand on that a little bit and talk about the differences between access, between economic abilities, between men and women, as well as between people of color and um, white people. Okay, great question. Um, when we look at income, which is our best number to look at when we talk about equality, we know that women earn less than men do in the workplace, and women often have more responsibilities. There's more poverty among women than there is among men, and divorce usually uh, puts women in the poor house, puts men in the White House. Um, okay, I couldn't help that. <laughs> but, it, but in any case, um, there, there is much intersectionality because when people talk about women, they fail to, re, to talk about black women. So we celebrate often equal pay day in mid-April. Uh, that's the day, by the time a woman works in, into the second week of April, she earns as much as a man earned for the whole year. But black women, we're talking about late August, early September. And very, rare, very infrequently do our feminist allies 
raise those questions or put an asterisk there. For Latino women, it would be even longer, actually. Um, and we very rarely want to talk about Native people and Native women. Um, the healthcare piece is important. There's a lot of economics drives the health situation in our country right now. If you have health care, right now people, increasing people are finding their co-payments are what prevents that. They might have health, they may have health care, but a co-payment, if a co-payment is 50 or, you know, in my, in my health thing, if I go to a specialist, I have to pay $80. Well, I can afford $80, but there's some people who can't afford $80. So do they get the necessary health care? And, you know, of course, President Obama increased access to health care. Last year, the number of people who didn't have health insurance went up. So this administration uh, has done much to basically minimize access to health care. So, I, you know, one of the things is when you talk about race and gender, um, it's, it's basically to look at this, the status of black women uh, very carefully, but also to look at you, not just from an economic perspective, but from the weighing of words. Um, you know, people, the, the Me Too movement has been very powerful, but in some cases, it has really ignored our history. See, I don't believe the woman all the time. I mean, if I believed the woman, then I would have believed the white woman who struck a match on her lover. You know, so I mean, until the I think it's the state of Florida, until the 1950s, no white person was prosecuted for raping a black woman. You couldn't rape a black woman. I mean, we were all presumed, there's one case, and I'm not, I'm not remembering the woman's name, Ruby, Ruby, Ruby. Oprah shouted her out um, when she spoke at the Emmy Awards. Uh, but Ruby was a 23-year-old married woman who was walking with an elder woman, older, older black woman, home from church, when six white boys in a car grabbed her, raped her so badly that she couldn't have any more children. She had a child, couldn't have any more children. Um, they said she wanted to go with them. Nobody was ever charged. You know, in another case in Florida, uh, two couples, black couples, they were FAMU students, um, were out, uh, basically they had gone to Lover's Lane or whatever, and they were having a good time as young people will. Uh, white boys basically came upon them with guns, told the boys to go. They intended to rape the girls. Um, one of the girls was able to get away. The other one uh, did, wasn't, and she was brutally raped. I mean, brutally raped by several people. The only reason that case did go to trial was because uh, the person who was sitting in for the sheriff was a kid. It was a young guy. He was about 19, white guy, and he had not yet inculcated all of the racism. Uh, so he basically was the one who broke that case. Uh, but anyway, of the young men who raped her, only one was sentenced to jail. Um, he was sentenced, he had a long sentence, but the interesting thing, her name was Betty something Williams. Anyway, after he got out of jail, he got early release. After he got out of jail, he, he was gonna kill her, Betty, but he ended up killing another woman named Betty because he just, he didn't know. He was, he was gonna kill somebody, you know, and so he did. So, you know, so I don't always believe the woman, I mean, and I think we have to really be careful, especially because of the way that white women have been able to lie on black men, you know, and basically get them uh, lynched, or worse. Well, there's not much worse than lynching, but, you know, inc incarcerated, lynched, et cetera. I mean, there, there are so many cases that um, there's one where a woman actually uh, got a man, um, not, he wasn't lynched, he was incarcerated, um, and he, be he, he became disabled because of the beating that he got. Fifteen years later, she says she lied. Yeah. And that the woman, that, that Emmett Till woman, yeah. you know, she's still walking around. You know, and she says she, and now after all this time, she says she lied. So we have to be really, really careful. We talk about just believe the woman. Okay, one more question. Oh, two more questions. And then that'll be it. I'll try to be brief. <laughs> okay. You talked about economic external infusion, or I got it wrong, but it's EEI. 
Um, uh, you mentioned opening accounts at blank out, black owned banks mm -hmm. and other organizations that donate to. Uh, do you have kind of a list or a way to go through of where somebody like me can just put some infusion of cash into something that would create real leverage? Uh -huh. Put it in the book. Yeah. <laughs> That will be a good thing to put in the book, and you're absolutely right. But there, you know, some of our organizations are doing work to build wealth. Um, I think of some of the work the Urban League is doing. Um, I think of some of the work. The NAA is not really so interested in economic stuff as it is NAACP, as it is in voting and access and those kinds of things. But there, there, there are some other organizations. So you've motivated me to you do a bit, little better of answering that question. Thank you. And I think we have a last question, which, because y'all know what, it's, it's uh, about midnight in D.C. Uh, <laughs> I'm cool, but it's about midnight in D.C. Hello, Dr. Melville. Welcome to Sacramento. Thank uh, you. I am a retired teacher. I come from the South, and I taught elementary, young men at a job course center, and middle school. And I find that we, we forget to teach children to be intellectually curious. Intellectual curiosity is very important. Children have to love to learn, and we have to make it fun. It doesn't have to be painful. And so I'm saying <laughs> we have got to think about the people that we put in schools to teach children and to work with children, and that's going to be the key, getting them to love going to school and feeling that it's important. And I think the churches and the schools have got to do a better job of making our children feel loved and wanted and appreciated. Thank you so much. That's such a great point. You know, what I would say, as we've, uh, over the years, we've learned a lot about learning styles. Uh, now, it's not always implemented in classrooms, but we learn some people learn visually, some, auditor, some people are auditory. One of the things we know about boys is that boys tend not to want to sit in a desk. They want to move around. Um, they grow out of it eventually. Uh, but basically, young boys, you see the, the, a lot of the unruliness. And one of the challenges when white boys are unruly, it's seen as, oh, they're unruly. But when black boys are unruly, they're seen as delinquent, uh, problematic, all of that. So we really do have to spend more time thinking about what, as you say, how young people feel loved, respected, um, and challenged. But we also have to be willing to say that everybody doesn't learn the same way. Everybody can learn, but everybody doesn't learn the same way. So you get these rigid teachers who have you sitting in your desk, you know, you know some, some young people aren't going for that. You know, they're, they're out of there. School has not become fun. Dr. Malvo, before I express our sincere thanks to you, would you forgive me just slipping in a commercial? <laughs> the commercial is that last year this congregation embarked on a study of Jim Wallace's book, America's Original Sin. Um, we're going to be, in the next few months, embarking on a study of white fragility by Robin DiAngelo. And um, what we're doing at the moment is training some leaders, getting ready to have those groups work with that book so that it's not just a, you know, academic intellectual exercise to read the book, but it, that it's a life-changing consciousness-raising experience. Anybody who wants to is welcome to come and be a part of those groups. So if you're not a regular St. Mark's member and you'd like to be a part of that process, I think it's going to be really exciting and we're going to be doing a lot of sharing with each other and, and working with that material. So. Great. Apologies for the interruption. I just wanted to say thank you for challenging us, for inspiring us, for pushing us, for educating us. Thank you, Dr. Julianne Melville. Thank you, Pastor, and thank all of you. I appreciate you. <laughs>